Welcome to our online church experience. We're so glad you're here. The service is about to kick off, but before we do, I'm just popping into your screens to give you some quick tips on how to best navigate your experience. If you're joining us on a laptop today, to the right of your screen, you will see a live chat room where everyone who is watching online can pop in and say hello. So why don't you pop in, say hello. You've just got to put in a quick nickname so we know who you are, but jump on and say hi to everyone. Down the bottom right corner of the video screen, you will see a button that says live prayer. If you click on this, you will be taken into a private one-on-one -on -one chat room with one of our team ready to pray with you. If you are new here or visiting for the first time, we would love to say hello to you. So jump up to the top panel on your screen, click on new here, fill out the form and one of our team will be in contact with you shortly. To participate in giving during our online service, you can jump up to the menu at the top of your screen, click on giving, and that will take you to our online giving options so you can participate during the service. Hey kids, to access your online kids program, jump up to the menu at the top of your screen, click on kids, and you will find what our amazing Kids Church team have prepared for you, which is actually accessible 24 seven. So anytime during the week, jump up, click kids and you will find your online service. If you would like to connect with us further or let us know that your details have changed, jump up to the top menu, click connect with us, fill out the form and one of our team will be in contact with you shortly. If you are joining us on a mobile today, you will notice that under our online service is the live chat room, which you can feel free to participate in. If you click on the live prayer button under the online service on your screen, you'll be taken to a one-on-one -on -one private chat room with one of our team who is ready to pray with you. This will automatically open on your screen, but to simply navigate back to the online chat room with everyone who is watching from the service, under the online stream, just click chat and you'll be back. If you are new here, would like to find your online giving options or find the kids program or simply connect with us further, just jump up to the top left of your screen, click on the three bars and you will find those options ready for you. Thanks so much for joining in on my brief tour on how to navigate the online church experience. It's about to begin, so quickly go grab a tea, find a comfy spot on the couch and enjoy the service.
Hi and welcome to our online church experience. I'm Rohan. And I'm Jess. And we are part of the team here at C3 Lane Cove. C3 Lane Cove is a spiritual community centered around Jesus. And we're so excited to have you here at 10 a.m. Yeah. If you're new though, we'd love to connect with you. And one of the ways that they can do that is... Through the chat. Jump in the chat right now. Say hi. We'd love to greet you and know you by name. Yeah. Otherwise, you can also... You can also... use our connection card, which is up in the menu. You can fill that out and we'll be able to reach out uh, to you through there. Yeah. We've got a great service lined up for you, um, but it's not too late to invite someone. Yeah, you got everybody's got a friend, got a neighbor, got a relative that they can invite along. Yeah, that's um, right. And how can they do that, Rohan? Um, well, the link is a great way to do it, but otherwise, just give someone a call right now. It's not too late for them to wake up, we'll get out of bed, put yeah. some PJs on, nice. and jump in for the online church experience. Anyways, we're going to go into our prayer request right now, and Jess is going to lead us with that. Perfect. Let's go, church. Let's pray for these people. Lord, we thank, thank you, you that we have awesome people here in our church, Lord. Yes, God. And we thank you that you yeah, care about everybody in our church, Lord. We pray right now for all these prayer requests that we that I have in my hands, Lord. I pray that you provide your help. You provide them with health. Yes, God. You provide yeah. them with their needs, Lord, and that you be with them all the time because they're not doing life alone with you, Lord. Yeah, and we thank you again that you're a God who answers prayers, Lord. Amen. We have heaps yeah, of answered prayer um, cards in here as well, which is super awesome, Lord. So we thank you for everything that you're doing mm. and that everything you'll continue to do through our church and our people. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving now. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship.
even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Even when
church hope you enjoyed that worship space everything we do in church is about worship worship is such a a beautiful thing to be involved in worshiping god with our tithes and our offerings uh, is something we do every single week and we worship god in different ways with with our voice um, just by turning up but also with giving our, our finances to god and his purposes Many of us have already had the opportunity to do that uh, through direct debit during the week. But right now, we're just inviting you to participate with us if you'd like to. And uh, if you'd like to do that, details are on your screen. I've always been fascinated with the topic of wisdom. How to live life well in a broken world. That's, that's what wisdom is, in my opinion. Um, Proverbs 3 verse 9 tells us something about wisdom. It says this, Honour the Lord with your possessions so i stop right there um that's something that i never learned to do um just naturally as a as a child i never thought that that was something that you should do that you should honor god with your possessions nor did i know how to do it it was something that i needed to actually learn how to do how do you do that the next um part of that scripture says uh, give to him the first fruits of all of your increase give to god the first and best of all of your increase you know you can't really ever give God seconds uh, imagine having some friends around uh, for for lunch or for dinner uh, and they're important friends of yours and and you enjoy being with them and and what do you do you don't give them leftovers imagine what that would be like if you, if you arrived at someone's place and they served off up, up to you last night's casserole out of a plastic Um, bowl that they had oh we're not sure what we've got here here you go no we don't do that because those people are important to us and so we want to put out give them our best we want to put something special on for them to let them know that we really love them that we really care for them and we're really interested um, in the relationship so it's the same with God we give him our best you cannot um, you cannot give God your leftovers you cannot um, you cannot appreciate anybody with leftovers Um, uh, you know sometimes we do that maybe I'm sorry if I made you feel embarrassed this morning but but can I just encourage us as we give to God and with our general attitude towards giving to God we need to be giving to God what he's worth what's God worth well you could say he's worth everything yes he is worth everything but God just asked us um, that when we come to him that we would give him our best Um, after all we've got a good reason to do that God gave us his best he gave us Jesus his one and only son he gave us his absolute best heaven sent heaven's best to us in order that we might be know that we're loved and in order that we might be given something eternal life that is that we might have a life so as we come to giving this morning can I encourage you to to give something to God And let it be something that expresses your best towards God in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning and we come to worship you this morning, um, we are so grateful, Lord, that you gave your best for us. And we want to be like you in every way. So, Lord, we give to you our first and our best in Jesus name Lord as we honor you with our possessions you've promised also on top of that that you will fill our lives with your best and uh, that that our our houses our, our jobs our relationships and all of our world will overflow with your best thank you God in anticipation of what you are going to do in everybody's life in Jesus name amen good morning church my name is pastor Ben and we're going to share communion together And I just wanted to invite you, uh, whoever you are, that you are welcome to join us as we share this meal together. Just get yourself a little bit of bread and some juice. Uh, This is an open invitation from Christ and from us to participate uh, together in this. 
And as we get ready to do this, I wanted to read to you from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. It says, God demonstrated his power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. What an encouraging, powerful section of scripture that is. That though Christ was dead, he was resurrected in power. And the great promise, the great reality is that you and I now become his body. His church is his body. And although his body was broken on the cross, he was raised in power and given all authority, which means that we, as his body, are unbreakable. To me, this is so encouraging right now because it might feel like we are stretched. You know, there's 250 of us, maybe more, in maybe 100 homes all across this Sydney region and beyond. It feels like the body of Christ is stretched. But we might be stretched, but because of the resurrection and the power in Christ, we are unbreakable. In fact, the very power and authority that God poured into Christ, he now pours into his church, into you and I, so that we might be the fullness of him to our world. As we come to eat this morning this bread and this juice together, you might be sitting there in your room alone staring at a screen, but I wanted to encourage you that this is not an alone moment. You might be looking at this moment as just a symbol, but it's not just a symbol either. This is a unified moment of grace for his body, the church. As we eat the bread and drink the juice together, there is grace that unifies us not only one to each other, but all of us to Christ the head together. There is grace that will come and fill you afresh with the power and the authority that is Christ's himself. And there is grace that means that even though we may be stretched across this region, the body of Christ, the church might not be able to meet physically, we might feel like we're being stretched, the grace present here means that we are unbreakable. And better than that, that we are the fullness of Christ's presence by his spirit to our world. You know, this morning, church, as you eat and drink, I want to encourage you that this is unifying, that this is filling, and this is a presence moment. From this moment, we go forward carrying the presence of Christ to our families, to our friends, to our baristas. This meal is a reminder and a moment of grace for each one of us. Would you let me pray for you this morning? Heavenly Father, Jesus, we thank you for your death on the cross, that you defeated every power and authority against us. Lord, we thank you for your blood poured out, the promise of relationship with you. And this morning, Lord, we pray that you would make your body unbreakable, That grace in this moment would unify us, would fill us, and would send us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. For the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Sing it out, God. Our God will never fail. I'm going. 
gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. We're gonna see a victory. We're gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord.
church. Hi, church. So good to be together again. Uh, we've got a great message coming up. Can't wait, actually. I'm I really know. enjoying the Sermon on the Mount. Series. Is and um, Pastor Mike, Yay. the legend, will be speaking today. Awesome. And uh, so looking forward to that. How are you going? Well, at the moment, I'm in book heaven. Uh, you've noticed you a few books around the place. Yes. I had a bit of a One disaster. One every other day. <laughs> oh, well, we had a bit of a disaster because we accidentally double ordered <laughs> a bunch of books. So we're just kind of drowning in books. But I took seriously Pastor Joel's challenge at the beginning of the year to read 20 books in 2020. So I've just been trying to steadily get my way through those. It's helping um, you. Loving that. My mm-hmm. biographies, I love them. And then mm-hmm. a few more technical Books. And you're pretty busy. I, oh look, I, I am life. I'm not about to die from boredom. I've just come off a lovely two week full time stint helping in both the pharmacies I work in, filling in, um, mm-hmm. you know, and also just loving connecting with people on the phone. I'm really missing people, mm. aren't you? Like just seeing everyone in person. You miss so. everybody. I do actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so just trying to just chat on the phone and pray for people. I really, really loving that. And actually, mm. On another note, we've got a bit of a baby boom happening around well, church. Well, you know, isolation. Yeah, you know what they say. <laughs> um, no, we've already had, I've worked out in this year, we'll have at least six babies wow. born, unless somebody's got Amazing. an unknown set of twins maybe, but uh, we've already had three gorgeous babies born yeah. in the church. And coming up next are Donna and Ming, a big shout out uh, to them and also God Lily and Jackie. Guys. Yeah, we're praying yeah. for you guys. And in the next few weeks, we're going to have another couple and one more mystery one towards Ooh, the end of the year. So now Started the gossip. I know. So we'll be <laughs> praying for you. And, you know, it's also been wonderful seeing so many visitors uh, in worship spaces. Yes. Coming as we've opened up and folks are bringing their friends, Amazing. which is cool. And, and obviously also wow. online. We're really thankful. And yeah. a big shout out to you if, if you're visiting us online. You know, God's at work. Amen. Right? Yeah. Um, even though we don't always see it or appreciate it, but he absolutely is. That's right. So uh, what's coming up, sweetie? Holidays are finished, I think. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. School, <laughs> school holidays. Some of the uni holidays are still going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, the government just extended JobKeeper yeah, for so another good. six months, yeah, what um, a which actually yeah. I think is really encouraging yeah. for uh, any struggling businesses, uh, mm. it gives a bit of stability. Mm. Next week, we have the pleasure of hosting Pastor Jake Betlam. Our good mate. From Barunga. Again. Um, yeah. And that's going to be great. Jake is so revealing of of God. He's really got an edge. Um, He's wonderful. So uh, Make sure you're in whichever space, church, yeah, don't you miss can it. be in next week. Don't miss Pastor Jake. So, uh, sweetheart, what are, you, what are your thoughts about what we can do to keep ourselves steady at the moment? Right. Um, well, I think <clears throat> quite simply just stay connected to God, mm-hmm. but also to all of his people. Yeah. Um, in isolation, don't get isolated. Yeah. Right. Um, like we've all got families and friends, um, but not, not everyone does actually yeah. Uh, yeah. have so many people, um, by the way. But God places us in a global family called yeah, church. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's a big deal. Yeah, um, well. I think it's really important. And I think it's important because we learn from God in the context of one another. Totally. You know, no man is an island, right? And look at what Jesus, look at the model that he set for yeah. us, yeah. where he chose, yeah. he selected a small That's group right. to be with him to begin and to, to change the world. It really. wasn't an accident that he did it that way. No, it was um, on purpose. It, it was and a model. <laughs> Look, we're in a massive shake-up uh, in the world, and um, but God is always thinking about securing our future, which he shaped yeah. through Jesus. Yeah. Um, our PM just said that now uh, is the time to lift our eyes Beautiful. as a nation. And yeah. I, I think so encouraging. Um, despite the Victorian outbreak at the moment, That shouldn't change that. We have to lift our eyes. Mm. Faith should not just be my personal faith Mm. um, in Christ. Faith is meant to change the world around us. Um, And faith in Christ is about faith in a person who died because he loved the whole world. So let's have faith for the future now. And I believe, we hope that we can actually impart some of that, stimulate you in some of that um, through our church. Okay, so shall we pray? Yeah, let's do that. God, we are so thankful for your people everywhere, that you are right here in the midst of us. You're not far away. Yes, Lord, I pray for 
us and for everyone watching, Lord, mm. you would help us to lift our eyes again, Lord, if we've yes. allowed ourselves to become discouraged yes, or despairing. Yes, Lord, we're sorry. I just pray you'd help us to lift our eyes again yes. because you're always at work and you're on the move. You're moving. Keep us moving, Lord. That's right. And yep. um, help us in, into our futures. In Jesus' name, we pray for everybody who's yep. listening in this morning. Amen. Have Amen. a great God time. bless you. Bye. See ya. Well, welcome to week three of our Sermon on the Mount series. Last week, Pastor Ben preached a sensational message on uh, why we are the kingdom people. And today and next week, we're going to be preaching on how to live as a kingdom person. How do we relate to others in the kingdom of God? You know, in Genesis, it, uh, we read that human beings were created to function in the capacity of God in the world. We're designed to act like God acts. We're designed to do as God does. God made us functional. God, he designed us for impact. Ben talked about that. God made us to work, uh, to be fruitful, to make stuff happen. He designed us to make stuff happen in others, to multiply. He designed us to subdue. He designed us to bring stuff under control and to bring order into our worlds. That sounds really great, but there's one big problem. Uh, and that problem is that people are broken. I'm broken and I live in a broken world. However, we always say the brokenness is out there. I tend to like to think that, look at the news and go, the brokenness is outside of me. And the big, big lie that we, all, that we all sort of believe, and it's an ancient lie actually, is that we can arbitrate between right and wrong independently of God. We don't actually need God in the picture, that we can love without a God who is love. It's an absurdity that we can uh, love the world and others without God who is love sitting at the table with us commenting. You know, we have a saying in our church, a Christian is a person who loves what Jesus loves and does what Jesus does. That's great. That's fantastic. But I also like, there are some things that Jesus hates. And today, we're going to look at some things that Jesus hates. It's, I'm going to have to cut you a little bit today. And I hope you understand, I'm your friend. I, I love you and I hope uh, you love me. And I've been through this, uh, looking at these scriptures uh, a little bit, and I've discovered that, uh, well, this stuff's cut me. And there, because there are some things that Jesus hates. He hates contempt. He hates it when we hold it, we, when we say a person has no value. That's antithetical to love. That's the opposite of love. Love says every person has intrinsic value. Jesus hates disloyalty, not sticking it out, running when the going gets tough. Because God's love is a rugged commitment. God's love goes to the cross. God's love says, Father, forgive when we're hurling insults at him. And the, other, the third thing we're going to look at is lies. Well, that's pretty easy. The Bible tells us that the devil is the father of lies. He manipulates words for selfish ends. Whereas the scriptures say love rejoices in the truth. So as the people of God, I hope you understand, we have to take seriously what Jesus takes seriously. And God wants to cut us for our good. He wants to, he wants to get inside and with his precision, a holy scalpel, Cut out those things in our lives that are getting in the way of the kingdom having the full impact on our world. Jesus isn't cutting us because he takes pleasure in cutting, but because he wants to remove things that are killing us and so that we can be kingdom people. So with that in mind, we're going to look at three parts from the Sermon in the Mount. We're going to look at anger, lust or desire and lies or our words. The first one, anger, comes from Matthew 5, verse 21. It says this, You've heard it said to our ancestors, Do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says, You fool, will be subject to hellfire. So, 
if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid your last penny. Wow, these are hard words by Jesus. And I think it's dealing something with something that we all struggle with. Something that we all really, if we're honest, struggle with the area of anger if i'm honest i get angry about things every day i'm pretty quick to get angry at that guy who cuts me off in the traffic i'm pretty i'm pretty quick to get angry with somebody if they if they come across me or they tell me something that's wrong with me and i don't know them but jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the law, Pastor Ben told us last week, is God's intention for the world written down. If that's the case of the law, and if Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, then Jesus is God's intention for the world lived out. And, but what does that look like for us? If we are God's people, if we are created to be in the image of God in the world, what does it look like for us to live out God's intentions in His family, the church? Well, there's two things I need to say. This is a problem with people, but people are God's purpose. God wants a people to make himself present with, to presence himself amongst. And the whole of the Bible is the story of God making a way for himself to be present with people. But people are also the problem. They're God's purpose, but they're also the problem. But the difference between God's rule and reign being active and my personal rule and reign comes down to how I think about and respond to people. So I ask you this question, and I think it's an important question. Do you think of people as a hindrance or a help? Are people helpful or are they a hindrance? Well, viewing people according to their utility, what they can do for us, that's a dangerous place to be actually, because as soon as they're not long, no longer smart enough or talented enough or skilled enough, we ditch them. I, I remember the opposite can also happen. I remember one story when I was at the Conservatorium of Music studying. I was a young, young musician, upcoming musician, and I didn't know that many people. I was a bit tentative. And this uh, girl who was in the opera stream found out that my aunt, who's actually a very good opera singer, that, I, that she was my aunt, she found that out that Yvonne Kenny was my aunt. And as soon as she found that bit of information out, she actually said straight to my face, if I'd known you were related to Yvonne Kenny, I would have taken more notice of you. That means that she was really only interested in me for my utility. So flattery is when we talk someone up for the sake of utility, for the sake of what they can do for us, for us. And a put down is where we talk someone down for the sake of making ourselves seem superior. Either one, the Bible says, is wrong. Either one is really all about us. It's self-focused. So the Bible tells us in 1 John, if anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, He's a liar for the person who does not love his brother or sister who he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. So there's a link between how we view and treat people and how we view and treat God. When people spoil our plans or get in front of us or hinder us or disagree with us or divert us, or if someone is, uh, we see a skilled in a way that can bring us up, what do we do? We, we, can get, we can go to flattery or we can get angry when the person is getting in the way. We feel an anger when, when someone comes against us, says something against us. It's natural to feel anger. And the psalmist tells us in Psalm 4 verse 4, Be angry, but do not sin. Reflect in your heart while on your bed and be silent. 
So anger, feeling anger is not the problem. It's what we do with that anger that becomes the problem in our world. How do we respond when we feel angry? It's natural to feel angry. I feel angry every day uh, when someone cuts me off in traffic. Sydney traffic is a great place to, to work on your anger problem. Just drive around a little bit in, in Sydney and it won't take long for me. But if we want to be God's image bearers in the world, what do we have to do? Well, Tim Keller has a great little saying that I'd love to share with you. He says, we should be people who are like God in the world. So that, what is God like? Well, he doesn't have blow anger. He doesn't blow his stack. He doesn't just feel angry and immediately go into a rage. Not blow anger. Not no anger. So the, the appropriate response is, and I think this is for a lot of Christians, is we go, I feel really angry, but it's wrong to be angry, so I'm just going to turn it inwards and not say anything if someone has wronged me. Maybe they've done something wrong because Jesus in this passage says it doesn't matter whether or not the person you're the person who's getting angry or on the, on the other receiving end of it. So anger can come from both whether we're the wronged party or whether we're the party that's been wronged too. So not no anger, but rather slow anger. Not blow anger, not no anger, slow anger because God is slow to anger the Bible tells us many times the nature of God is that he's slow slow anger recognizes something has upset us but it doesn't react straight away Jesus talks about the blow anger here when he uses two insults rucker which means fool and stupid like a moron actually where we get the root for the word moron or idiot we have to be very careful about our words because when you say call someone a fool or, or, or empty headed, you're saying the person has no value whatsoever. And now that is antithetical to the gospel. That's the opposite of how God treats people who say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing toward us. Jesus says that that attitude is so antithetical so opposed to him that he uses really strong language he says you're destined for the for hell and hell in these times the times of first century was a garbage heap outside the city you're destined to just be a, a, a thing of no use at all so if you say someone is of no use you're of no use to the kingdom of God is what Jesus is getting at here He's not mincing our words. And if that doesn't cut us a little bit, then I think we need to get on our knees and say, Jesus, uh, I need to be softened here because I know that cuts me pretty deeply. We need, so what is, what's the take home? What do we do? We need to be intentional about keeping our relationships with our brothers and our sisters in, in Christ's suite. Jesus even says, it's so important that even when you're offering, when you're doing something, when you're in the middle of worship and you suddenly understand that, that, uh, that you, your brother has something against you, your sister has something against you, put the offering on the ground and go and talk to them. That's how big a bigger deal Jesus sees this. So be careful of the put down. Be careful of writing people off. Be careful of cancelling people out. We live in a cancel culture. Don't do it. Don't even be careful. Just don't do it. A dumb idea does not equal a dumb person. Be careful of our cancel culture. Christians, we fall out. We have differences of opinion and we're subtle about it. We're not, but we can be nice to someone's face, yet in our heart we haven't forgiven them. Jesus says we need to forgive. And, we need to, and the next thing we need to do is we need to settle our disagreements face to face. We need to own the fact that something has upset us and we're just, can we have a coffee? Something you said really upset me. I, I know you probably didn't mean it this way, but this is how it felt to me. Can we have a discussion about it? Bring Jesus into the middle of it and we can move on. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32 says this, Let all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting and slander be re removed from you along with all malice and be kind. This is what the kingdom people look like. We're kind. We see people as the same as us. Kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you. Number two, we're looking at desire or lust. Love is loyal and God hates disloyalty. 
Matthew 5, 27 says this, You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you that you lose the one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So sex is great. Let's just say that. God created sex. Let's start with the fact that God made it and he made it wonderful and he made it beautiful and he made it to be one of the highest and transcendent things that are in a committed relationship that we can, we can have. And now I've been married for 22 years and I can tell you that according to this precise definition of a, the, the precise definition of adultery, either sleeping with somebody else, I'm, I'm a tick. But I can also tell you that according to the way Jesus talks about it, aligning my life with Jesus' view on adultery, if I'm honest, I'm a big cross, I'm a big fail. And it's a hard word because is it really true that even when I look at a woman the wrong way, when she crosses my path, that I'm moving into that territory that Jesus hates? Well, let's be honest. Jesus is going to extremes here to get our attention. He's using hyperbole. And, and so we, we have to understand that this is a big one for men and for increasingly women, that we live in a highly sexualized culture. And it's a huge trap. So, but why is Jesus being so full on about that? Isn't sex good? The world's telling us that just go and, go and enjoy it. It is a good thing. There's no reason for, for all this uh, concern about sex that the church seems to be concerned about all the time. Let's dig a bit deeper because sexual fantasy is just that. It's a fiction. It's a fiction. It's not reality. And God deals with truth. It turns a person that God created in the image of God into something that exists for my own pleasure. And it might only be in the pleasure in my head, or it might lead to being acted out where it actually creates real problems for people in the world. In a nutshell, it's greed. And if I'm, it's not dealt with, if it's not nipped in the bud, it can be some, come, come something more sinister. It turns a person into an object. It's a false image. And the, the Bible has a word for that. It's an idol. The Bible relates many times in the Old Testament that sexual promiscuity, when he's talking about Israel going into, into idolatry, that they're falling into adultery. And this concept of bringing idolatry and adultery together happens time and time again. Why do the writers of the scripture do this? Well, Tim... Keller puts it like this in his book, Counterfeit Gods. What's an idol? It is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. A counterfeit God is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly be worth living. So this is the deal. Sexual love replaces love for God because it's so transcendent. It's so, it, it, because the very fact that it is so wonderful and so pleasurable and so out of the ordinary is the very thing that's also dangerous about it. God shaped us. God, one person has said, God has given us a God-shaped hole in every heart, every human being. I would go so far as to say God has given us a, a God-shaped vacuum. And if we're not going to get that hole filled by God, well, it'll suck in other things that are transcendent. So what do we do? Well, Jesus is saying that to acknowledge that if you struggle in this area, tell someone. And it can be embarrassing, I know. It can be embarrassing to tell a Christian friend or a Christian leader, hey, I'm struggling in this area of my life. I've, I've developed some bad habits that are not helping me. But when you do that, and it, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be like cutting off an arm or gouging out an eye. 
But we need to take some drastic action, some action that's going to, when in the cold light of day, when we're not being tempted, we can say, I agree, this is wrong. I don't want to be doing it. That's the time to take action, not in the heat of the moment when we're one click away from something that we shouldn't be clicking or when we're about to say something to somebody that is going to lead us down a path that may, may hurt them and us. Put something in place before that where you can talk about it. And the consequences of the embarrassment of talking about this stuff are, are going to be far outweigh what's going to happen to you if you just allow this stuff to fester and go down the road. So if you struggle with this, you're not a freak. No temptation has seized you except what's common to everybody. Jesus wouldn't be talking about this as a big deal if he didn't think the whole of humanity struggles with it. Everybody has an air, struggles with this. But if we can take some action, we can talk to someone, if we can be courageous enough to talk about it, we're going to move on and we're going to find some freedom. Last one I'd like to talk about today is words. Jesus says this, verse 33, Again, you've heard it said, it was said to our ancestors, you not must, must not break your oath, but must, you must keep your oaths to the Lord. He's talking about telling the truth. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, even by heaven because it's God's throne, or by the earth because it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head because you cannot make one single hair of your head black or white, or make it grow back, but let your eyes, your yes mean yes, and your no mean no, anything more is from the evil one. Let's just put it this way, the evil one's a liar, and he's a really good liar. He's really good at manipulating words. And he comes to Eve in the garden, he's, and he says this in Genesis 3.1, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden. He puts that to Eve. It's a really interesting statement because it's almost exactly word for word what God said, except for one word. Because God really did say something very close to that. But this is what God actually said. He said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. The devil's words were, you can eat from any... Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? God's words were, you are free to eat from any tree in the, of the garden. There's only one word difference. That's the difference between can and can't. The difference between God and the devil is one word, can and can't. Who can forgive our sins? God, the devil can't. We can't, by any kind of our words, make the life we want it to be. God can. And Jesus uses two words here. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Could it be even more plain? God means what he said. The devil hides it. God creates. The devil manipulates. God lays it plain. The devil baits. God is a word. God's word is a wound that leads to healing. The devil's flattery leaves a sickly feeling. In my guts, it lays me low. It says, you can't, when Jesus says, go. The evil one manipulates, but God orders chaos. His word recreates. Are your words creating possibilities in people or are they manipulative? It's a very simple question. The evil one manipulates words to get his own way. God's words create. He orders chaos. He does what he says. God's after people who are trustworthy with their words. What's the take home? If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you say you're going to be there on a certain time, be there on that time. If someone asks you to do something and you know you haven't got time, tell them you haven't got enough time. Be straight up. We're designed to do as we say because God's like that. Amen. I hope all of this has helped you and I'm going to pray now because we've got, there was a lot to get through. So let's pray as we, as we end our message. Father God, in Jesus' name, thank you for all these words. They do hurt. We have to be honest that I have to be honest that in these areas of my life, I need your help. But Lord, you have placed us in the world to have an impact. You've placed us in the world 
to 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 be truth tellers to see people as you see them beautiful in, in and in your image and we pray that you would help us to allow your kingdom to get a hold of us and to be your ambassadors in the world for your name's sake we pray amen God bless you. What a great message that was this morning. I know God is speaking to you and he's not just speaking to you, but he wants to make a connection with you inside your soul, inside your heart. And um, God loves us. He sent Jesus into the world to make to connect with us, to speak to us and, and to show us what he is like. So this morning, what I'd invite you to do is simply this. Just take a moment right now. Close your eyes in prayer and let's pray together. And what we're going to ask is, and what we're going to say to God is, Jesus, I want to give you my life. So let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying in my place for my sins. Forgive me. And Jesus, I give you my life. I trust my life to you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, then something from God is going to happen in your heart, in your soul, and um, we can explain more about it. And we'd love to make a connection with you today. And so we would invite you to just uh, reach out to us and you'll see details on the screen uh, to show you how you can do that. So God bless you. Have a great day. See you again. Wasn't that just the most awesome service that you see? Such a good message. I'm um, really looking forward to going through that in my own time, actually. Yeah, and you can do that using the link that we have provided you with. You can share that on your social media or send it to your friends or family. Yeah. Um, but other than that, look forward to seeing you guys next week. All right, bye. Bye.